Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And I'm an alcoholic. Oh my God. I would like to, first of all, thank the committee for asking me to come. I, uh, this is the first time I've ever been to a conference in Houston, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. The hospitality has been absolutely superb, and uh, the friendship and the love that we always share in AA meetings and conferences has been, I think, exemplary display, uh, an exemplar. Uh, in the display of affection and caring. I arrived at the airport. I uh, I work now. I'm capable of holding a job since I have become sober, and so I couldn't come in on Friday. But I came in uh, yesterday morning, and uh, I got to hear the speakers. And last night when Paul was talking about bizarre behavior, sometimes we will sit and we will listen to a speaker and we... Uh, our memories are triggered, you know, by things that have happened to us. And, uh, you know, if you were an outsider looking in, um, our conduct and behavior now, you might even say that it's a little bizarre because I arrived at the airport and Jay met me with a sign and it just said, Yvonne. Now, I've traveled a lot and, uh, landed in a lot of airports, and I've walked up a lot of ramps. And it's not often, as a matter of fact, it's never that you see people standing in airports with just signs that just say a person's first name. And if you were just a plain civilian looking in on our conduct and behavior, that's a little weird that, you know, people just stand around with signs that have first people's names on them, and then I walked up as though I had known him forever. Like, yeah, here I am. <laughs> a friend of mine uh, who used to have a drinking problem, still does, did not know that I was in the program, and he went to an AA meeting. And so uh, months later, he said, you know, I went to one of those double-A meetings, and he said, let me tell you what they do. And I said, yeah. Uh, not even breaking my anonymity, he said, when you go to those meetings, he said, people stand up, he said, if they have what they call speaker meetings, sometimes they're discussion meetings, and they'll stand there, and they talk about their wives leaving them, and their kids leaving them, and being in jail, and everyone goes, yay, and they laugh and scream. (laughs) And he said, it's an absolute tragedy, absolute tragedy, and those AA folks think it's hysterical. <laughs> and then I remembered one of the first meetings that I went to when I heard an, uh, an old-timer talking about 12-stepping someone, and uh, his pigeon couldn't make the program. And I was brand new, and he sat up there and he said, well, he went on his, his last drunk, he said, uh, and so he called me up. And so I said to him, are you sick? He says, oh, yeah. I said, good. <laughs> Are you vomiting? Oh, it's terrible. Good. <laughs> Are you destitute? Oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm dying. Good. Yeah. Now, if you were a civilian or just anybody and walked in an AA meeting and we reacted in a situation like that, it's true our behavior would be considered bizarre and our reactions to situations would not be normal. And yet it is through this kind of therapy when when I heard Paul talk last night, he was talking about having fun. And it has been my observation that everyone that I have ever met in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is a fun-loving person. We love to have fun. That's why I drink, is because I love to have fun. And it got to where it wasn't any fun anymore. But I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I still love to have fun. And we go to meetings, and we still love to have fun without alcohol. And things that are tragic to everyone else, to us, are hysterical. We love to have fun. We like to laugh about it. And that's part of our getting well, is that we don't have to close the door on our past, and we don't have to carry that off guilt and remorse. And then a memory was triggered when I was 
listening to Paul again about, well, our uh, behavior may be a little bit bizarre now, but I used to do really weird things too when I was drinking. And all of my conduct was not really motivated by good intentions. A lot of the things that I did had become motivated as a practicing alcoholic by emotional needs. And I was living in Southern California, and I wanted a friend. I didn't have any friends, and it was very important to me just to find somebody that I could talk with or communicate with that would understand me. And so I was drinking, and I didn't know anyone, and we were living in the valley, and so I picked up the Van Nuys newspaper, and it said, Flying Saucer Convention is to be held at City Hall or wherever. And I thought, maybe that's where I will go to see if I can find a friend. <laughs> and I might meet someone, and they could make a contact, and I could... A ship might come and pick me up and take me home because I have, I've never belonged here in the first place. And so I went to the Flying Saucer Convention, but needless to say, I had to drink before I got there. And I was drunk when I got to the convention. And all I wanted to do was be friendly. Now, it's enough to live in Southern California. That's per se weird. You know. But to go to a flying saucer convention is even weirder on the count of people came in and they had long flowing togas and long hair and scarves around their forehead and long beads and this was uh, this was the costume of the evening, I guess. And I was dressed in street clothes and I tried to talk with these folks, just you know, really drunk, really rebellious. Just trying to talk with someone that would, would understand. And so I sat in the back of a room, not feeling as though I had been, that I fit in. And the lady got up and she sang the Star Spangled Banner. And there must have been a crowd of probably 750 people there. And I stood up in the back of the room drunk when she finished and I yelled, Sing, fly me to the moon. <laughs> And they threw me out. <laughs> so a lot of the things that I did, though my motivation was that I just needed a friend. I my behavior was bizarre then, and I guess probably it's even bizarre now. Because I still go through the same Paul was talking about having a committee in your head. And I identified with that. But when I have committee meetings sometimes now, it's just, I call the meeting, and it's God and myself, and it's usually a monologue. It's always a monologue. And so whatever the problem is, we, I try to discuss it. And I say, now, you see, this is the problem. I'd like to identify it for you, you know, as though God doesn't know what my problem is. And then I would like to outline it, and it's a and B and C and then subparagraph and then these are the asterisks and so I lay it all out. So I discuss it a while and uh, the only problem is I have, a, you know, I don't get any loud voices in my head that say that God is answering me. And it always ends up that it's exactly the answer that is given to me before I ever call the committee meeting on the count of uh, I have discovered the longer that I have been sober, that I don't have any choices anymore. Absolutely none. I think it's traditional down in Texas that we give our sobriety date, and mine is February the 11th of 1969. And uh, I assume that means that next February, if God's willing and the creeks don't rise, that I will be able to go to my home group and pick up an 18-year cake. And I'd like to stand up here this morning and say to you that I really had been sober 28 years because I first came to AA in 19, I guess it was uh, 59. And uh, I, had, I had a problem because I had a little slip and it lasted for 10 years. And I was in and out of AA and, uh, you know, even finally when I came back. 
In February, the people used to stand in the coffee shop and they would make bets that I wouldn't make it. And uh, I had a problem in identifying with people that were alcoholics on the count of people who were alcoholics drank alcohol and they did crazy things when they were drinking. I did bizarre things when I was drinking, but by the same token, I did weirder things when I was sober. And uh, at the time, I always had a reason, and I could always rationalize, justify, and compensate for everything that I ever did. And I can still do that today. And that, I think, goes to the basis of that I have an alcoholic mind and will always have one. And that's the reason that I still have to go to meetings and that I still have to try to work this program. And the longer that I am in the program, uh, to me, it is more obvious that it is much more simple than I could ever even dream. I came in and I was always complicating things and, and analyzing, and you know, they said, don't analyze, utilize. And I was much more concerned in what my motives were and, and why I did certain things. And they said, none of that makes any difference. You just do the things that we tell you to do. I used to do weird things like uh, I worked in Washington, D.C. when I was in law school and I worked on the Hill. And one particular session of Congress on the Hill is terminology that you work for a congressman or a senator. And so one session would never end. And we didn't think they'd ever go home. And we didn't have any relief. And so finally it ended and everyone was celebrating. And the way that I celebrated was to go to a dime store and to get a water gun. And I filled a water gun, and I went around the halls, and I, you have to understand that they have policemen in the halls, guards in the halls of Congress, and the security is very tight. So I had a water gun, and I was flashing it, and this upset the guards. They didn't know what kind of a gun it was. And I just went around shooting everyone with a water gun and drinking. And they open up all of the offices. There, I think there are more alcoholics per capita in Washington than any place I've ever found because everybody that I knew drank. And so after I used the water gun, I ran out of water, and I went into one of the committee rooms. And I, I'll never forget, there was a congressman there from Texas, and his name was Tiger T. I remember that. And I didn't have any water in the gun, so I picked up a real lemon squeezer and shot him in the face with condensed lemon juice. <laughs> and he didn't take too hotly to that, and so they asked me to leave again. My whole deal was going someplace and getting asked to leave. So I decided, well, it's too early for the party to end, so we got on a train with a group of people and rode all night long and drank and went to Akron, Ohio. Now, why, don't ask me. I think that's a good place to go. Never been there in my life, and we got there about six in the morning, having been drinking all night in the club car, and we got off of the train, and I caught an airplane, and I went back to Washington, and went back to work at nine o'clock. Totally unpredictable. I couldn't have told you that that's what I was going to do. But my whole deal was having fun, doing something strange and bizarre, which to me was fun. It certainly was not normal behavior. Today, I have those same thoughts. If there's anything that upsets me, it's when I have to go into a supermarket and I will see the cashier and I will make the beeline for the cashier and someone cuts in front of me with a cart. And the cart is piled high. Now that aggravates me today. I go into a bank because you see, I still have those same thoughts. They don't know who I am. They don't know that I'm in a hurry and that what I've got to do is more important. You go into a bank and uh, I'll get behind someone in a long line before the teller and it invariably ends up that the person that is in front of me will pull out one of those plastic bags with change and they're counting the change. And then I will switch and go to another line and I just use the lines with me in a bank because they don't understand that I have a really important mission which is nothing. <laughs> they just don't understand. I get on an elevator. I get aggravated. If I am going to go to the 10th floor, the committee meets up here, 
and the elevator is filled on the first floor, and do you know that those people will punch two, three, five, seven, nine, and instead of just letting me go to the tenth floor? So I still have the same committee. I still have the same thoughts. I still have the same living problems. The same living problems. But the difference is now, and again, it's like Paul said, it's how you consider it. Are they problems or are they not problems? It's kind of like <laughs> if someone would ask you this morning, are you happy? The instant someone asks us that question, we have to stop and think about it. Now, when we start analyzing as to whether or not we're happy, we're not. Because it's just a state of being. It's just how we feel. And it's our whole attitude. When I came to this program back in 1959, I listened for the wrong thing. I uh, had graduated from law school, and I had gone to work for a federal judge, and he was in the circuit. And so we'd gone up there to whole court, and I had been drinking, celebrating, having fun, and I uh, had gotten in some trouble, and the federal judges convened at a bar called the Brown Palace, and I had had too much to drink, and I think I probably insulted, you know, most of them there with some clever remarks. And I knew I was in trouble, and so I decided, well, I'll go to an AA meeting, and then that way I'll get the heat off. Now, you have to understand that I knew all about Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't the thing that, you know, where I just read about it or someone I knew when. Because I knew about AA for years and years and years, back 1952. And the program had not been too old in Oklahoma, and there weren't very many members. And my concept of AA then was that they met in garage apartments and they had secret knocks to get in and they had clandestine handshakes and passwords and the whole thing. And uh, nobody went, and if you went, nobody talked. You know, they didn't talk about it. Because my mother had come to the, to the program back then and she had a little difficulty making it. And it took her about a year before she could ever get a sobriety date. I'd been raised in an alcoholic home, and so I knew what it was like to not know what the conditions would be when you come home from school. And a lot of times I would be away at college, and I would call, and my mother would answer the phone, and she would be drinking. And whatever the problem that I had that I wanted to share with her, I couldn't share on the count of she was drinking, and, uh, you know, she it was just couldn't talk to me. And so my my daddy was always threatening to for divorce, and he did a lot. And then she'd promise not to drink, and then there would be a reconciliation, and it was just, you know, no stability in our household. And I had a younger brother, and I felt as though he was my responsibility to, to take care of. And uh, I did all of the things, the, the children of alcoholics, I felt all the things that children of alcoholics feel. And they didn't have alatine back then. And uh, I didn't understand that alcoholism was a disease. I had no idea. I thought that she drank whiskey because that's what she chose to do. And that if she had a strong will, or if she cared anything about her family, that she wouldn't do that. And so with all of the upheaval at home, I think she had read an article in Post Magazine years before, and she made the call, and... And back then, those AA members came, and it was quite different than it is now. And I am so lucky that I was able to observe the way AA worked back in the olden days, when they literally came in and they sat with you around the clock. And, uh, of course, they were very enthusiastic about the program, and, you know, they wanted to pull people off bar stools. And my attitude was they're just hustling members. And uh, they would come out and work with her and visit. And at that time, they had a thing called 20 questions. And you would answer the questions. And at the age of 19, I answered those questions. And uh, if you had two that you would answer yes to, that meant that you had a problem. Well, I had about nine or ten. Because I had already started my social drinking, and I thought they were using those questions in order to solicit membership. They're really hard up. 
And they're all trick questions. You stop beating your wife. And uh, the question is actually, they are worded in such a way that there is no way that you can honestly answer them without a yes, or that it may be uh, a rare occasion that some of the things that have happened, but it doesn't mean you're an alcoholic, and so I totally disregarded the test that I took at the age of 19. I uh, I knew about the 12 steps. They used to sit around the, the breakfast room table and they would talk about the third step. And they talked about allergy of the body coupled with a mental compulsion to drink. And I thought that was a bunch of hogwash. That's poppycock. Whatever they want to say is fine with me if she'll just quit drinking. I don't care what they tell her, but it is a matter of convenience for me. I came into this program in 1959, I came back in 66, came back in 67, came in 69, and I still did not believe that it was an allergy of the body coupled with a mental compulsion, and that they just used that to sucker you in, so that you wouldn't think that you were really that weird, that you were crazy, and it was just kind of, you know, a spoonful of medicine. I mean, if sugar making the medicine go down, you're crazy drunk. And it took me a long time, a long time before I could accept this diseased concept. And it's exactly right. It is a disease, and I have come to believe that from the bottom of my heart today. But back then, I thought that it was stupid. I uh, I didn't give AA much credibility. Except one thing I did know, and that was that Alcoholics Anonymous worked for her. And she quit drinking, and, and I observed that she had uh, a new circle of friends. And they were weird. And they'd come around the house, and they'd bring the drunks in. And uh, the drunks would be sick and throwing up and shaking. And they'd walk the floor with them. And they would say, can you go five more minutes? five more minutes, and they'd shovel that honey down, and uh, the drunk would go five minutes, and they'd say, can you go five more minutes, five more, and they used to keep drunk two and three days at a time, and then they would have shifts, and one group would leave and go home, take a shower, go on to work, and another shift would come in, and it seemed like it was an underground, the way these A&As worked back then. But the point is that it was a one-on-one, -on -one, completely dedicated service program. The responsibility of the sobriety of another human being, they accept. They accept. I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous before they had tradition, because they didn't have anything. They just had those silly steps. And they had a thing in the preamble and it said that they, that you had to have an honest desire to stop drinking. Well, now they changed that later on on account of, I guess they finally figured out that none of us ever had an honest desire to stop drinking. I didn't. You just have to have a desire that none of us were honest about. And so I knew all about AA and I could intellectually discuss it. And uh, I knew about this allergy thing, and I could talk with people about that. So I went to that meeting in 1959, and I knew more when I went in that meeting than I thought anyone in the room. I didn't hear anything that they said, not one thing. Because the things that they talked about, fear, and they talked about losing jobs, and they talked about guilt and desperation, and, and they talked about being spiritually bankrupt. And I had geared everything. You know, I, I had a good job. I hadn't lost it yet. I didn't have any family to lose. And here I was, a young professional person. I had graduated from law school. And uh, I had gone three years to a, to a Jesuit school in Washington and then finished at the University of Oklahoma. So none of those things had happened to me. I walked out of there. I said, I'm convinced that I'm not an alcoholic. Now, with all of the knowledge that I had, I figured I know what drunks do. They get arrested on DUIs or 502s, uh, driving under the influence or while intoxicated. Drunks take drinks in the morning. 
Real alcoholics, real alcoholics go on binges. Real alcoholics lose family. None of those things had happened to me. And so I left and said, I am so lucky that I have all of this knowledge about what real alcoholics do. And I'll never be one. Because if I don't do the things that they do, that's my insurance. And my insurance will protect and guard me from ever becoming one of those people. Well, by 1964, I, was, I, I had married. I had three children. And uh, I was no longer working. And it's true. The alcoholism had progressed. While I was in law school at Georgetown, I was working on the hill and going to school, and I, I was sat next to a psychiatrist who was getting a law degree. I was tired one evening, and he said, here, try one of these. And he gave me an amphetamine. And this was back in 1955. And it worked, and it was wonderful. And it was a five milligram orange pill. And I said, have you got any more of them? He said, sure. And he wrote a prescription. And it was open-ended. And it was right then that I became addicted to, uh, to amphetamine, and I ate them like popcorn. And the more you take, the greater your tolerance is. And he said, you know, and you get up in the morning and you drop about three of those with some black coffee and you're off and you're running. And you take them all day. And I took them all day under the excuse originally it was that I had to study for finals. In law school, the only problem was finals came and went and I had another reason that I had to study. And then uh, you take those all day and you're crazy. You are really crazy. You become paranoid. I uh, The phone rings and you just bounce off of the wall. I was in such shape that I did go take a law school final several years after that and I was still on those crazy pills and they had become absolutely daily. I was, I was addicted uh, terribly to them and uh, you hear things. And a guy was sitting there with a ballpoint pen taking his law school final and that pen scratched and the noise was so loud I jumped up threw my paper in the air went up and complained to the monitor that the man's pen scratched and uh, they moved me you know to another section of the room but my whole life had become unmanageable because of chemicals and I would take the pills and at night I would have to come down and I would have to drink. Back then they had uh, another pill called Milltown. And, uh, you know, I am, I never did get to experience it in my, in my days practicing alcoholic, anything like Valium and Librium, because that came out after I got sober. But they had Milltown, and I would take Milltown if I got nervous. And so I go to work, and it was just so cool and calm, and I had a pair of earrings that I treasured more than anything in the world. And I wore them one day to work. And the secretary that sat next to me said, those are really nice earrings. I said, here, you can have them. Yeah. That's whatever. Whatever. At this meeting in 1959, not identifying with what any of those people talked about, and further reinforcing my own belief that I was not an alcoholic, I left. I knew what alcoholism was. I understood it, and uh, with that in mind, I continued to do the same things that I had always done, and I was taking the pills, and I was drinking the whiskey, and I had all those kids, and uh, there isn't anything that is quite as devastating as if you've got a hangover, and you're trying to feed a kid pablum, and uh, they don't swallow it, you know? And they just fill their jowls with it, and then they sneeze on you. It's that and washing out dirty diapers in the toilet when you have a hangover. And so I got a great resentment that my career was being thwarted because of all of these children. We had gone through several geographics, and we had moved to Southern California, and uh, there is no reciprocity out there in the area the profession of practicing law, so I couldn't practice. So I just set about taking care of all those babies. I had two in diapers at one time, 
<laughs> and I thought my little kid was going to go to the junior prom and still be in diapers. I didn't think he'd ever get toilet trained. <laughs> you know, and uh, that was my career, was raising these kids. And I knew that I was really secretly the female Clarence Darrow of the West Coast. <laughs> but I just couldn't seem to get it all together, and so I just drank. <clears throat> now, alcoholics don't stay drunk all of the time. You know, sometimes we just make them off basis. I would be sober in the daytime. To a certain extent, I drank wine, and you don't get about your heavy drinking until night. On the counter, you put the kids to bed, and the responsibility that is gone, and then you can get on with a hard lick. But I would get up in the morning, and automatically, the things that were they talked about in Denver, Colorado, at my first meeting, I had started drinking. And it's amazing the way this progressive disease comes upon us intellectually. Because I used to say, an alcoholic drinks before 5 o'clock. And I wouldn't drink before 5. And then pretty soon you could justify having a drink at noon. And I would say, well, people go out at business luncheons and they drink at noon, so there's nothing wrong with my drinking at noon. And then pretty soon it gets to the point, the insanity, the insanity of the disease, it gets to the point that I used to wake up in the morning and I would be so sick and hungover. And I figured out that over in England that it was 5 o'clock. <laughs> and it would be all right for me to have that early morning drink just to calm the jitters. And then I would start in on wine the rest of the day. Because if you drink wine, you don't get that drunk. However, I have heard several speakers say that, you know, and I did not know that I, wine to me was just a very simple thing. I, I remember they used to call them winos when I first went to AA out there, and I always wanted them to come up with a category for, for winettes, because that's what I was. And uh, progressively enough, the, the price of the alcohol goes down, too because I used to like Chevy Friesel and I was a big scotch drinker and then you end up just drinking plain old gallo wine because that's all you can afford. Your perspective is all messed up. Your values get messed up when you're a practicing alcoholic. <laughs> I decided, well, if they'll move me to Malibu, I'll take these kids and my problems will be solved and I will become a beachcomber and then I will have no pressures. I won't have to even drive on the freeway. I won't have to put up with the smog. So we moved to Malibu, and the only problem was that we took Yvonne. And Yvonne was Yvonne's worst enemy. And I got down there, and nothing changed. And I continued to drink, and my drinking habit and pattern was exactly the same. And I always had an excuse. If you have money in the bank, you drink to celebrate. If you're overdrawn, you drink. If the sun is shining and the fog does not burn off until noon down at the beach, you drink because it's depressing in the morning, and, it, and so when the sun shines, you drink to celebrate. And then sometimes the sun doesn't come out and it's just foggy all day, and that's certainly justification to have a drink. Whatever the excuse, I always had an excuse to drink, and in my mind, it was perfectly justified. It wasn't until I came into this program and, and I worried a lot about I had been here for a while about why am I an alcoholic? What is so different about me? Why do I have to be one? Uh, what about this physical allergy? What about this, this mental compulsion to drink? What is this thing, quote, this disease of alcoholism? When did I get it? And I used to worry about, well, was it July the 4th? at that picnic when I got drunk the first time. And was it in 1950? And finally I came across two sentences in the big book. And they're the answer to the entire thing. And they have satisfied me. And it's the only place in the big book that I have ever found an answer to describe my disease of alcoholism. And it's up at the front of the book. And I want to read it to you because it's probably, for me, the most important the most important communication. And when I get crazy today, I go back to the big book. Not back over here. It's in Dr. Silkworth's opinion. 
and I stole this book off the podium, and it's on page XXVI. Now, if you're smart, that's 26, okay? Last paragraph, two sentences. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. That's it. That's the answer to me. That's why I'm an alcoholic. Then the next sentence. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it, it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. And that's the whole story for alcoholism to me. Simply because I drank, because I like the effect, it doesn't have anything to do with when I became one. It just explains to me why I drank. And as my disease progressed, sooner or later, it says in the book, you cannot differentiate the true from the false. And that was my justifying and my compensating and my rationalization for everything that I did. I could not tell the truth from the false on account of as my mind became sicker and the compulsion became greater, I could give you a reason for everything that I did. I could give you an excuse. I drank to and because of, and I drank at people and at situations. We were evicted from our house in Malibu, and we had to move to a, a transient apartment house off Ventura Freeway. And my drinking continued, and I still could tell you, to me, a very logical excuse as to why I needed every drink that I ever took. And everything I ever did was an emotional need. In November of 1968, and I had been going to and from meetings, and each time that I left, and we were living at Malibu, I went to one in Santa Monica, and each time that I left an AA meeting, again, there was the reinforcement, I have not done the things that those people have done, and therefore I'm not an alcoholic. Now, I had been to psychiatrists, I had been to psychologists, I had been to every church that I could go to trying to find the answer for me, the purpose, the purpose that I was here. There's got to be a meaning to life. I went through instruction when I was uh, going to, to Georgetown. The Jesuits, they recruited me too, but it didn't, you know. Uh, I went to the Baptist church. I went to the Science of Mind church. I went to the Unitarian church, uh, the Church of Christ. I went to the uh, Christian Science Church. I went to every church that I could find, trying to find some spiritual reason for existence, and I couldn't find anything. Uh, when I was going to the psychiatrist, I convinced them that one of the biggest problems that I had was obesity. Now, you have to understand that I weighed 170 pounds when I was drinking. I was just all whiskey book. And I said, because I'm so fat, when I need some diet pills. And so they would write the prescriptions for diet pills. And then it was like the three bears and Goldilocks. And I'd call them up and I'd say, these pills are too strong. And they'd write me another prescription. And then I would say, these pills are too weak. And they'd write me another prescription. Now the only deal was I had all the prescriptions going at the same time. And I just had a whole medicine chest full of every kind of diet pill and amphetamine that you can think of. I couldn't find an answer. I could not find an answer. There is a, a scene that is in Alice in Wonderland. And Alice is talking to the Cheshire Cat. And she is at the crossroads. And there are roads that go in every direction. And she says, which road shall we take? And the chest cat says, well, where are you going? And she said, well, I don't know. And the cat said, well, then it really doesn't make much difference. And that's where I had been all of my adult life. And actually, you know, as far back as I can remember, because I never had any definitive destination as to what I wanted to be or what I wanted to accomplish. At any given time in my life, say, what do you want to be? Well, I want to be a female vocalist with Tommy Dorsey. 
You know, and I can't even, I, I'm told that. Or I'd like to be an actress. Or I'd like to be a doctor. I'd like to be a nurse. I want to be a school principal. Every day, it was something else. And I ended up, and I went to law school, and I really didn't even want to do that. I just didn't have any purpose. I didn't have any sense of direction. And it was just kind of going on from day to day. And it's true, I did live, like, 24 hours a day, just like we do now. But the point is, it was just surviving, just surviving. Nothing meaningful for me. Well, we had been evicted. We moved to Ventura. In November of 1968, I remember I went out and sat on the iron steps of this flea bag transient apartment house, and uh, I cried. I had all those little kids with me. My oldest son was not in school. We just kept jerking the kid out of school. We just done so many geographics. And I got up and I went into the bedroom and. I prayed, I think, what I have come to believe is the universal prayer of every alcoholic. I didn't know it at the time. But you see, I still didn't believe. And so I had to qualify that prayer. And I said, God, if you were there, qualify. Please help me. Because I didn't know any place else to go. Nothing on this earth, nothing could I find that could relieve my pain. Today, if I were going to rewrite the big book, I mean, you may rest assured they're not going to ask me to do that. Because when I first came into the program, I volunteered, you know. I thought I know so much more. I explained to them that I was an English major, and some guy says, I don't give a damn if you're a French general. You know? <laughs> but I would delete one word and I would insert one word for me in my program. And you heard it today. I would say that alcohol is cunning, baffling, powerful, and I would insert the word impatient. Impatient. Because it doesn't make any difference how long you've been sober. It's still out there, and it is something that we have to guard and protect ourselves until the day that we go on our destination and our happy journey. The word that I would delete would be, be, a probably no human being could relieve our alcoholism, and I would delete the word probably for me, because no human being could in any way have helped me with my drinking problem. I tried it all. I tried everything. I used to read all of those positive power the thinking books. You know, there's one called TNT. And I read all that stuff by Norman Vincent Peale and I was drunk and I'd sit and I'd concentrate and focus with one eye. To try to figure out how I could get my life together. What to make it meaningful. I used to sit and read the Bible. You know, I have a whiskey glass stain right on the top of the Bible because I would sit. And it's a good thing we had it in red and black letters because I couldn't have differentiated who said what, you know. But I'd read the Bible and try to figure out there's got to be something to lie. But I didn't believe in nothing, in nothing. And nothing would work. Well, God, who... I have come to believe is my higher power today didn't do a miraculous trick on me in November of 1968, but I had to wait a while. We moved then at the end of the month into a home in, in Van Nuys. I got my kids in school. I thought everything would be fine. We had a little bit more stability. The only problem was that we were so broke that we didn't have any money to buy a refrigerator. And so I took my wine bottle and rinsed them out. Well, that was an improvement. And I poured the milk in the wine bottle and I tied a rope on them and I floated them in my swimming pool because I had to have a swimming pool. My, my priorities were a little screwed up <laughs> with no refrigerator but a big pool. 
and the man came to install the telephone, and he said, do you know that you've got bottles floating out there with ropes on them to a of course? You know, to me, that was normal. And he said, well, why don't you put them in the refrigerator? I said, I don't have one. And he said, oh, and, you know, bizarre behavior, bizarre behavior. In January, I had the Hong Kong flu of 1969. Sick, really sick. And so I decided I would doctor myself and I would drink hot buttered rub, you know, and that makes you well. I had a friend that came to see me by the name of Paula Ann, and I had gone to high school with her. Now, Paula Ann's mother was an alcoholic. And all the time that we were in high school, I could go to her house, and her mother would be drunk, and she didn't have to apologize to me for that. Or she could come to my house and the same thing. We understood each other, because we both had the same problem. And the first time I ever took a drink of alcohol was at a slumber party at Paula Ann's. And I got drunk. And I felt the same way with that first drink that I felt with the last drink. And I got drunk and I got sick. I was a puking drunk. Uh, certainly never a lady when I drank. Uh, I threw up in my plate uh, on many occasions. Sometimes I'd pass out in the seat of a restaurant and never get to eat. And they were lucky or I'd have thrown up. But... Paula came to see me, and she was the director of a little theater in Fresno, California, and she had three children, was divorced. So Paula and I sat there, and we drank the hot buttered rums, and we spent the afternoon, and we had a third party there, and who also had gone to high school with us living in California, and they left, and the third party called me and said, Paula Ann thinks that you may be an alcoholic. I was absolutely devastated, devastated. She drank, the alcoholic, but she drank just as much as I did. My behavior was no different from hers. And so, no one had ever said that to me before. I had been called alky, drunk, but not by someone that I had been raised with. And that bothered me a great deal. I think probably I was on a roller coaster the last two months of my drinking. And I just went downhill fast. And so the man that I was married to had gone on February the 11th to do the laundry because we didn't have a washing machine either. And uh, my M.O. was to drink uh, lightly in the daytime. Sometimes I, you know, had accidents and drank too much. If I got too tight, I always put my kids to bed and they made them take naps. My oldest son said he had bed sores by the time he was six. <laughs> you know. And so I put those kids to bed, and uh, I got on with my heavy drinking, and I don't know what happened. Except that all of a sudden, I was absolutely lucid. As lucid as I am now. And I got up, and I can't explain to you what happened. I walked in, and I poured the drink down the sink. And I was too drunk to physically dial the phone, but I walked over to the phone and I dialed the operator and I said, get me Alcoholics Anonymous. And she did, and she called the North Hollywood Clubhouse. And I tried to communicate with them and they said, we will have someone there. Now, I think psychologically what happened to me was I had always considered alcohol as my friend. Alcohol did things for me that another human being could never do. It made me feel comfortable. It made me feel at ease. I was able to converse with people. I did not feel inferior. I did not feel as though I didn't belong. Of course, I went to the extremes when my conduct was weird and bizarre. But it relieved that god-awful hole, the gnawing of the hole in my gut. It made me feel acceptable. And I never had felt in my entire life as though I had ever been accepted by another human being. But that psychological, I don't know, the instantaneous change in me was all of a sudden when I had relied upon alcohol as my friend to do all of these things for me. If you had come to me and said, we're going to take your whiskey away from you, 
Now, there's one thing an alcoholic cannot tolerate, and that is the feeling of deprivation. Try to hide a drunk's bottle, and you've got a fight on your hands. On account of they'll either bust you, or they'll go get another bottle, and they'll hide it someplace else. But you cannot take alcohol away from an alcoholic, the practicing alcoholic. And it's that feeling of deprivation when you walk in the kitchen, and there you see you have this much left, and you panic. And you figure when the liquor stores are going to close and how you're going to get there. It's the lack of supply. We go crazy. The feeling of being deprived. So as long as you came to me and said, we're not going to let you drink anymore and we're going to take the alcohol away from you, I would have never gone along. I would have never accepted. But I had relied upon alcohol for so long to help me survive and help me exist, that the transition was that I was not going to give up a friend, which inferred the feeling of deprivation, that I was going to get rid of an enemy. And there's a big difference. And that is when I took the first step. I don't know how I took it. I don't know why I took it. And it doesn't make much difference to me. But I had reached the point that I knew that if I drank that I was going to die, and I knew if I didn't drink that I was going to die. And I knew that I had to stop and I couldn't quit. <clears throat> I uh, did things that were crazy when I wasn't drinking. I never could relate my drinking to my insanity. You see, when I didn't drink is when I was really crazy. When I didn't have the cushion or the anesthetic is when the committee met up here and they went on and on. And, you know, they talked about the calm last night. Well, I liken that, and you people in this part of the country, it's like a hurricane. With all of the commotion and the trauma and the craziness and the confusion, and in the center is the eye of the hurricane. But I never could get there because it was just confusion and insanity. And I never found a reason for being. I didn't know where I was going. That night, they came. Three of them. From Alcoholics Anonymous. And they walked in and one had, I think, three months sobriety, another one six years and one nine years. And I didn't want to talk to those people who had been sober a long time because it's inconceivable. It was to me that anybody could stay sober that long. So I talked to the girl with three months. The court had come in and had taken her children away from her because she was an unfit mother. Now, that's what I wanted to discuss. Because I knew that eventually that was going to happen to me. Because I knew that if I kept doing the things that I was doing, I was not a good mother, I was not a good wife, I was not a good person, and not a good human being. And so she said, I said, how do you keep from drinking? And she said, I do it a day at a time. I had heard that for years. And it never registered. Never registered. And they suggested to me that I get the alcohol out of my house. They said, well, I keep a rattlesnake in your house. And they stayed hours and hours and visited with me that evening. And I had finally gone in to take a shower. That's another thing. Drunks don't take showers. I was afraid I would melt. But I I cleaned up for these people, and I was sitting there, and the mascara, you know, was black all down my cheeks because I'd been crying for so long. And the things that I tried to express to them, they said two magic words. They said, we understand. We understand. The program in action, the language of one alcoholic speaking to another alcoholic. And I want to say this. And I've done it periodically now a lot. As I have seen AA and I have seen it expand. I am so grateful, so very grateful, that when those people came in and talked with me that evening, and I was dying and crazy, and they said, we understand, that the second thing that came out of their mouth, they said, if you want to quit drinking, we can help you. That was the statement, rather than 
Do you have any hospitalization insurance? I am so very grateful that I was able to see AA in its genesis. And even, you know, when I came into this program, my mother used to, I used to sit around and argue with her and say, you don't understand, things have changed, da 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 And she'd say, no, they haven't changed. Now, my mom will be 35 years sober Christmas, and it's more important to me now to listen to what she says about Alcoholics Anonymous than it ever has been, because AA hasn't changed. It has not changed. The people have changed, but the concepts have not changed, and they remain the same, and they are still as strong, and they stay still as rigid, and it still works in its purest form. And so, they left, and I started the following evening, or rather the following morning, really, embarking upon an entire new way of life that I had never known before. And they started calling me, and they called me all day long. And they literally talked me through that day every five minutes. In between times, if I got nervous, I called them. I talked to people I didn't even know. They gave me telephone numbers. And their hands reached out, and I survived that day with the love and the compassion and the understanding and the strength of Alcoholics Anonymous. I started going to meetings, and I had been sober, I guess, just a couple of weeks, and it was just a miracle to me that I didn't have to drink. And I, I did all of the things that they told me to do. It was a program of attraction. But you see, when you get it together, after maybe a week after you're sober, all of my thoughts came back, and, and I started explaining to them who I was, and that I knew all about AA, etc., it took me that long, you know, to get, to even be able to make a sentence, I think. And so they said to me, we don't care if you're from Yale or jail. They said, for you, I tried to explain to them that I had a lot of degrees, and they said, well, you know, that I had a doctor of jurisprudence, and they said, well, they said, we know something else that has a lot of degrees, and it's a rectal thermometer. <laughs> For you, you sit down and you shut up and you listen. You leave your head outside. That's what got you here. And they said one thing that I, you know, kept me coming back, and it was, it was horrible. I didn't get a lot of love and, you know, all of affection and tolerance through how to treat me in order to make me hang in. They said, we have known a lot of people who are too smart to make this program, but we have never known anyone who is too dumb. Sit down, shut up, you don't have anything to say. And uh, I did not speak in the podium until I had been sober over one year, because they would not let me. They said, you haven't got anything to give away. You just come to the meetings. And I did, and I went to a minimum of five meetings a week, and I think that I was subterranean. That's when they were making the bets in the coffee shop. And I was crazy, absolutely crazy. And I resented carrying the ashtrays back. I resented having to go back and wash coffee cups. And I had all of the same crush and arrogance that I had ever had. But somehow or another, I allowed these people to inflict their judgment over mine. And I did what I was told to do, and I hated every minute of it. But there was a difference. The people who could not pron pronounce anonymity correctly were not puking in the pot every morning. <laughs> they seemed to have the answer to this deal, and I didn't. I think that Alcoholics Anonymous is not in intellectually stimulating. I think that it is spiritually stimulating. These stupid, dumb people that I detested so much that somehow managed to stay sober, have their act together, and be happy, used to use their mouths to get sick, and we came to meetings and we used them to get well. Everything that we did was in the plurality. It was 
We came to believe. We admitted in the first day. We made a decision. And it was the strength of the group and the plurality. I started getting better and better and better. I was so crazy that I, the way I understood the serenity prayer was that God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And to me, that was that I was an alcoholic. And that's how I applied the serenity prayer. I'm talking about for a long time. I couldn't change that. And then the courage to change the things I can. I applied that to change my drinking habits. It had nothing to do with living. It had nothing to do with problems. It was just how I had to survive a day at a time. And that's what I had to do. I don't know when the compulsion was lifted. That's unimportant. Totally unimportant to me now. But I know this to be true. And that is that this is a program of attitudes. And for me, changing my attitudes was like trying to move a cemetery. Because I'd go to those meetings and I would beat on my high chair and I'd suck my thumb. And they just didn't understand all of the things that I was going through. And yet, somehow or another, there's one thing that I remember. And it's true today, and it keeps me from going, going crazy today. When you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, they ain't no big deals anymore. It's all over. No big deals. And we just... Being sober in AA doesn't take away living problems. It just teaches us how to cope with them so that we don't have to drink in order to escape. And in teaching us how to cope with living problems, we have, from time to time, I think, felt frantic moments of serenity. You know? And you're sober longer, and you get a little more serene. My description when I was drinking is that my entire life was just one constant, one constant state of panic interrupted intermittently by moments of hysteria. And that's how I live. And then I got some glimpses of serenity. And pretty soon they lasted longer, and they lasted longer. It's given me a sense of direction. A sense of direction. It's like the traveler that was traveling along the highway in Oklahoma in the back rows, and he, he was lost. So he pulled up beside the road and he said to the farmer, he said, you know, I'm, I'm lost. He said, I'm looking for this town and I can't find it. And the farmer explained to him, he went down to the next fork in the road and turned to the right. And the traveler said, I, sh I really appreciate what you've done for me. He said, I was just lost. It wasn't anything. I would have never found it without your assistance. And the farmer says, no. He says, you ain't lost. You just need a sense of direction. And that's exactly what happened to me. I had no place to go, just, and I came to this program, and I was never lost. But you people taught me with the tools of Alcoholics Anonymous what to do with my emotions. And I learned that drinking was never my problem, that it was my answer. And I have always said, I liken it to an automobile wreck, that it is not the fuel that is at fault, but it is the driver. And I was responsible. Three things happened to me when I came in. One, I learned that alcohol was not my problem but my answer. And two, I was responsible for everything that I had ever done or would do. And number three, that God loved me. And that was the changing point in my life. I learned that God had no stepchildren. When I was out there before, I used people and loved things. I came to this program, and I learned how to love people and to use them. I used to pray for things in order that I could enjoy life. God gave me life so that I can enjoy things. I came to believe, and it was slow for me, in a higher power. Very slow. I went to a meeting one time and they said, the question was, how do you take your third step? And the guy said, it's just like walking up to a cliff and there's total blackness out there. 
and you just jump. Well, now, there was no way that I was going to do that. I mean, that's really insane. So I went home that night, and I prayed. My sponsor had said, you pray to become willing to become willing. That's how I've had to take every step. I haven't taken any of these steps because I wanted to be a good member of AA, because I wanted to show off for you. I wanted you to like me and approve of me. But I have been reluctant. I have fought every step of the way because the AA program is totally alien to my entire personality the way I had always lived. And we alcoholics don't give up easily, I promise you that. And we give up, and we have to give up, and we have no other choice. So I went on that night, and I said, okay, I had the committee meeting. God, I'm going to pray to be willing to be willing, whatever the hell that means. And I'm going to do what this dumb broad wants me to do, my sponsor. She'd been sober 19 years. So she, and she was from Alabama, and she said, it's like you put your toe in the dough. <laughs> and so in my own mind, what I did, in my simple little mind, I said, I want to surrender, and I don't know how to do that. Because that, you know, I can't surrender. I don't trust you. I've seen what you've done to me. Everything you've done is your fault. You know how we go back and forth and you debate at the committee meeting. So I reached the point of surrender when I said, okay, I'm not so stupid as to believe that if you, God, wanted me to die tonight in my sleep, that you couldn't make that come to pass. Debate. And if it be your will, or if it be providence that I die, at a very young age, with a lot of potential, <laughs> you can do that. I said, I won't argue with you over that. So I reached the point in that discussion that I was having that I became willing to die. I became willing to die that night. I had no kids to raise. Things had just turned around in my life. I wasn't having to drink. And I had my entire future ahead of me. But I became willing to die. I went to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, I died. And I thought, gee, God, you didn't pick last night, did you? <laughs> Once I made that surrender, it was a lot easier for me to turn my life over. That was just peaches. Great. That was easy doing. But that's how I had to initially take my third step. The plea bargaining was over. Eventually, the concept that came slowly with me in knowing or beginning to believe that God loved me and that he had no stepchildren was that with no plea bargaining, all of my life I had been treated as though, if you are good, you will be rewarded. When you're little, and your parents go someplace, and they come back, and you've been good, they get you an ice cream cone. They take you to the diamond store. But you have to be good before you're rewarded. Now, the reward, to me, was synonymous with love. They loved me, because I was good. So my concept of God was that if I were bad, and I had been, I thought. A lot of my guilt was imagined, and a lot of it was real. But that if I were bad, God couldn't love me. That, to me, is rational thinking. That's rational. I used to come to these meetings, and it upset me when you all would give the Lord's Prayer, and it would say, lead us not into temptation. And I spent weeks researching that, and I found out that in the Hebrew translation, it was lost. And when the brothers and sisters of the master went to him and they were talking to him, friends, etc., about give us a prayer that we can pray. What the master said was, say this in temptation. So every time at one of these meetings you all get up and you 
give the Lord's Prayer. I do just what you do, but in my mind, I am saying, say this interpretation because it didn't make sense to me that you would have God up there holding the apple on the string, leading you into temptation if you're really doing God's will. So there were a lot of conflicts that I had, religious conflicts that I had learned from the time that I was little that I had to resolve. And it just took complete and total surrender. I, I learned that God has loved me all along. In my afflictions, he was afflicted. In my triumphs, he was triumphant. I have a sign in my bathroom. Every morning I read it. And it said, He who made the eye shall he not see. He who made the ear shall he not hear. And he who made the heart shall he not love. And that's gotten me through some pretty rough days. There's no doubt in my mind now that this program was spiritually inspired. And today I find it much easier to surrender. Doesn't mean I'm more spiritual. Doesn't mean I'm any more spiritual than anyone in this room. It just simply means that after a period of time you learn the shortcuts. And you don't have to have the committee meeting. And you don't have to have the debate. And you don't have to plea garden and try to talk God into these things to see in your way. You just instantaneously, uh-oh, I give up. You handle it. Sweaty, I can surrender in 10 seconds. It used to take me three weeks. Not that I'm smarter. It's just that I have learned now that I don't have any choices anymore in how to work this program. I was divorced. <coughs> simply because I grew into the program. When the three people came that night, they said to us, you're either going to grow together or you're going to grow apart, and they were exactly right, because the man that I lived with did not participate in Al-Anon, and he remained the same, and all of a sudden I was a different woman than he had married. And it became necessary for my sobriety that we get a divorce. We had become roommates as such. We didn't know each other anymore, and it was just our priorities and our values were not the same. And so, in 1973, I was appointed. I had returned to Oklahoma, became assistant attorney general, and I was uh, appointed to the bench. And I served six years as Oklahoma's first woman state judge. And I had met a man in 1975 that used to practice law in front of me. I didn't like him. He was gunk, I thought. And the reason that I didn't like him is on account of he was smarter than I was. He was a better lawyer. The guy had been practicing for a long time. And he was a widower, and he had four children. And so I tell this because no one can understand why we got married. I still wonder about that. <laughs> and uh, But he was a, a hell of a nice guy outside the courtroom. But when we went into that courtroom, it was really bad. On the count of I would nearly hold him in contempt, and I would go home at night and say, how is he trying to reverse me? You know, and I knew that he was scheming and, and he was just smarter than I was. So he did reverse me. First reversal I ever had. Now, with an ego that a judge has, that's bad news. So, I lived in the country and, and, and I had a, a female Great Dane and I had heard that he had a male Great Dane. And so I called him up one night. <laughs> and my dog was, had decided that she wanted to get married. <laughs> and I called him up one night and we took the two dogs and we he came by my house he had his dog in the back of his truck in a cage and so we, we tried to put my dog in my back seat now when we put my great dame and they're about good sized dogs in my back seat a German shepherd got in the back seat with the dog and I was screaming get the German shepherd out and they were busy and you don't interrupt busy dogs and uh, we were trying to separate the two dogs. And it was just a mess. It was an absolute mess. And uh, he says he should have learned from that. you know. And anyway, we got the dogs to the kennels. And uh, a couple of months later, the dogs got married, incidentally. And uh, at the kennel, and that was in April. And uh, then we got married in August. And the puppies were German Shepherds. <laughs> And 
we put those two families together with his four kids and mine three, my three kids, and I want to tell you, it was craziness, absolute craziness. And I used to go to meetings, and I would complain to the guys, and I'd say, I had heard that he drank a lot. The reason that he drank a lot was simply because his wife had been terminally ill for a long, long time, and I could understand it why he would go drink. You see, I'd become the president of Alcoholics Anonymous in Oklahoma. <laughs> and I've been sober a long time, and I told him, you're going to have to go to Al-Anon meetings, and he went, and he didn't like Al-Anon. He said, those are really pretty ladies, and he said, they do not use, you know, they, they speak like ladies and everything. But he said, I, I, they keep wanting to talk about their husbands that are out there drinking, and he said, I've never seen you drunk. So he said, I cannot identify with any of this. And so, but he still went. That was the condition of our marriage. You law, you lawyers have to get everything down, you know. And he still went, and uh, but he became more difficult to live with, and I couldn't understand it. I get ready to go to an AA conference, and he would absolutely raise hell, and we would he would want to start a big fight with me, and I thought it was because I was going to an AA conference, and that he did not want me to participate in AA life anymore or to be with you people. And uh, there was no answer. And so I felt guilty for even going to meetings or coming to these conferences. And so my son had been asked to speak at an Alateen conference in Arkansas. And we got up to go down there. The whole family, my three kids, Henry and myself, were going to go. He started a big fight. And this time I just put my foot down. And he said, well, you laid in that bed. He said, uh, I, I was only slept 15 minutes, big deal. And he said, if I'd known you were going to lay in that bed all day, I would have just gone on to the office. It's craziness. This is the way it acts. It's crazy. So I said, you just go on to the office. And I took my children in my car, and I took my little old kids to that conference, that Alan on Alton conference. And on the way, I prayed. And I said, I do not know what is wrong with God that I cannot establish a relationship with another human being that is enduring and lasting. I don't know. There's got to be something wrong with me. I don't, have I not learned yet to love? Have I not learned yet to give? And I never did like Alan on women, ever. And I would go to these conferences, but I would always go here and talk. On the count of Al-Anon women looked at me funny, I thought, like I was trying to catch their husband. I never wanted to rot an old thing. Yeah. If there's any place that you don't want to go, find a husband, I promise you, it's an AA. They're sick. And uh, so I'd go to the meetings, and the Al-Anon women made me paranoid, and they'd get up there, and I said, anyone who would live with a crunk is really crazy. And I thought Al-Anon women were. Just nuts. I don't know what happened when I prayed, except I know this. I said, God, you're going to have to take him. I can't handle this anymore. That's one of those 10 second surrenders. I said, I can't handle it. And instantly there was a burden that was lifted for me. The Alanons have later told me that's called release, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So I went on to the meeting and and my kid got up, gave a good talk. And he didn't know, the rest of the kids didn't know. We got in the car and we came back home, walked in, and uh, I told him. We walked into the bathroom, looked in the closet, and sure enough, his clothes were all gone. I guess my kids had become probably well acquainted with people's clothes being gone. You know, everyone leaves, they marry Vaughn, they leave. And the little things uh, weren't too upset. Uh, openly, openly, found a note on the bed that I love you more than anything, but I cannot leave. And it was drunken handwriting. It said, call me at the farm. We had a farm. And I called him, and he was drunk, and he told me he'd had a car wreck, and that he was driving an MGB, and that it rolled over as he was taking his clothes out of the house. And uh, it had rolled over, and, and it had skidded, I think, 30 to 40 feet on its top. And uh, he didn't have his safety belt on. He was thrown out, and that's the only reason he was alive. My second son's comment was, if he's going to keep drinking, he's going to have to get wheels on the top of his car. <laughs> hey, 
Yeah. He told me he was that that he'd had this car wreck and that he had been drinking and that he hadn't eaten in three days. And uh, I called an Alan on lady. I didn't know what to do. And uh, I called an Alan on lady and she said, How much has he had? I said, I don't know, is he gonna convulse? I don't know. And I said, But I need to go over there. I need to get this whole deal straightened out. Like the script. Director, producer, and the big book. She said, no, she said, you do nothing. I said, you don't understand. She said, you do nothing. So, I called him back up, and he said, I haven't eaten. I said, go beg some food. He said, I don't have any coffee. I said, go beg some coffee. Nothing. I did nothing. And the first thing we had to ascertain was whether or not he was hurt. So then the, he kept calling me back and forth, still drunk, stupid, really stupid. And uh, so he called me the next morning, and he said that he was just so sick that he couldn't go to work, and I had known that uh, you don't lie. Al-Anons don't lie, and I'd become immediately an Al-Anon member. <laughs> and uh, he said, call the office, I call the office, and they answered the phone down there, lawyer answered the phone, and I said, Henry is, um, is at the farm, and he's wrecked the car, and he's drunk, quick. <laughs> Well, I all went rushing out there. I tried to figure out what the liability was. You know. uh, he called me back that night, and I had some soup, and I told him that if he would take a shower, he wants to smell day-old alcohol. Yeah. So you take a shower, and you can come by, and I'll give you some soup. He'd asked me, he said, I think I better call Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, he said, would you call so-and-so and so for me? I said, no, you call him. He says, I can't because they broke my glasses in the wreck. I said, I'll look the number up. You call him. Because I knew he had to do this. And so that evening he came by and uh, he, had, he was clean, though, still shaking. And uh, he said, I'm going to go to an AA meeting. I said, fine. He said, which one shall I go to? I said, you decide. He went to an AA meeting, the same one that he had always gone to all along, except when he walked in the door, he didn't take a left and go sit down with the Lady Allen. He took a right. And he went in and he sat down with the AAs. And that crazy old son of a gun has been sober eight years now. You know, that's... <laughs> we went through a thing with... He came in, and a year later, his daughter came in AA. And she's been sober now seven years. And then we went through a thing with our youngest daughter. And uh, it was a situation where, you know, uh, I thought I had all the answers. I thought I knew everything there was to know about AA. And uh, it's one thing, let me say this, it's one thing to release someone who is grown. I call them hairy-legged old men. It's one thing to release them with love if you're a member of al -Anon. And it's quite another thing to have to try to release a child who is 15 years old that you have carried and nurtured. And it's not the same. And it's extremely difficult, if not impossible. <clears throat> and so she decided that she was going to experiment and use drugs. And she did. And we went through a whole thing. And I'd take her out of school and go her someplace else. And then I'd take her out of that school and send her to college and take her out. And, you know, I did the whole thing. I did the whole thing. Tried to pick her friends and uh, tried to dictate everything. And, uh, of course, at that point in time, her judgment was nil on account of you take, you take a bunch of kids and you put 98 kids in there in a room that are straight and you put in a user and you bring in another user and they'll find it dead. They've got antennas. And all the users in school and all the drug folks find each other. And they run in groups. In groups. I tried everything that I knew to solve this problem and it didn't work. She uh, was sober six months and went back out. And a uh, year and a half, I was crazy. Everyone was crazy. I was really crazy. Got her a job. Found her an apartment, furnished it, got the car, paid for the car, got the job. I got her the job where I work and uh, quit coming to work. And uh, they called me and they said, 
she's not coming to work. And then I had to come to grips with the whole thing, the reality. I could fire her. And the director of our agency called me down and he said, she hadn't been to work in two weeks. Is there anything that, that I can do to try to, to help you in this that we don't have a reason not to fire her? I said, fire her. They fired her. She lost the apartment. Car was torn up. Furniture. Ended up eventually, I don't know, hitchhiking or some damn thing. And so her birthday came around in August. And uh, I didn't call her. And I didn't go look for her. I want to tell you, sometimes the easiest way, we have a thing of hang in there, hang on. And it's supposed to display some kind of a sign of strength when you hang on. Sometimes the strongest thing that you can do is let go. And that's what I had to do. And when I finally gave up, she gave up. Got a telephone call from her in August, early in the morning hours. Didn't look for her for her birthday, didn't do anything. She'd been to A for six months. She called and she was hysterical. I can't really remember what happened, whether I hung up or would you call me back, I don't know. But I do remember this, loud and clear. She said, Mama, I will go to any length. And she had remembered from the six months before. Robin has now been sober two years. Stand up, Robin. <laughs> She nearly killed me. She nearly killed me. I cannot have choices today. People stand up from the podium and they say, I have a choice as to whether I'm going to drink or not drink. I don't have that choice. I have a choice as to whether I'm going to live or die. It's as simple as that. Fire. Sobriety is keeping me alive. And if I don't have sobriety, there's no way that I can exist. I know that. I know that. I've come to believe I have no choices as to whether I'm going to work this program or not work. I'm too miserable when I do things. I have the committee meetings. I know what I've got to do. I stray. I do a lot of wrong things. I've done everything wrong that there is to do since I have come into AA. One exception. And that is, I have not had to use chemicals to drink alcohol. I've made a lot of mistakes in judgment. I am sure I've offended people. I am sure that there have been days that I just am an absolute you know, raving egomaniac. That's because I have an alcoholic mind, and this program is totally foreign and alien to everything that my being that I've ever been. I've come to believe that the only thing that stands between me and God is my ego, and that I can have a a better spiritual connection. But I have to work on it, and it is a daily thing for me. No choices. No choices. And they wanted to challenge the wisdom of the old man, the sagacious leader of the group. And everything that he said was wise. And the young people who were total rebels said, we're going to trick the old man and embarrass him and humiliate him publicly for the rest of the tribal members. And they said, we're going to get a bird. We're going to ask him what it is. And then we're going to ask him if the bird is alive or dead. And if the old man says that the bird is dead, we'll open our hands and it will fly away. And if he says that the bird is alive, we'll crush it. And he won't have the answer. And so they went to the tribal meeting and they said, old man, old man. And they put the bird out. What is this? And he answered, it's a bird. And they said, is it alive or is it dead? And the old man looked and he paused and he said, it's up to you. So my friends and members in Alcoholics Anonymous, with no choices, living or dying, it's up to you. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.